Your Excellencies, members of the Females Council, members of the Females, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, allow me to welcome you in the name of International Institute for Middle East and Balkan Studies, CFMS from Ljubljana, the organizers of today's lecture of Abdullah Muram from University of Chicago with the title Geopolitics in Middle East and South Asia, Lessons for the Balkans. A special welcome and gratitude goes to our guest today from the United States, the acclimate and highly respected Mr. Huram. We wish Abdullah Huram a, place, a pleasant stay in our wonderful country. In the 20th century, both the Middle East and Balkans found themselves at the epicenter of global sectarian and ethnic, sectarian and ethnic conflict respectively. Since then, these regions have come a long way, not only have they experienced the creation of new nation states and identities, but also numerous new economic, economic opportunities. Despite this, the burden of, identity, uh, of history and the revenge of geography keep dominating many aspects of their current social political outlooks. Today, as countries in these regions are on their way to democratize, uh, they, uh, they face serious domestic and international challenges. From fixing, fixing domestic economics to resolving key re regional uh, foreign policy issues to navigating between the interests of boards, major, major powers or core issues will require uh, serious societal and political efforts. Drawing on from the nationalism discu discourse, uh, diaspora politics and geopolitical lessons from the Middle East and South Asia, this lecture with emphasizes of the key lessons for the Balkan countries. In doing so, there uh, will also be a special emphasis to discuss the United States policy towards Balkans and the new democracies and the opportunities and challenges posed the rise of China. Abdullah Kuram is South Asia and Middle East fellow at Polytact and strategic advisor of Gulf State Analytics. He based at the Committee on International Relations, University of Chicago. Formerly, Kuram was a researcher associate at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C., and his previous research work has also been based in the Institute of Strategic Studies in Islamabad, Pakistan, and the Economic Policy Research Institute, Cape Town, in South Africa. Amongst other places, he has just lectured at Columbia, Duke University, Bangladesh Foreign Service Academy, and the, and the National Defense University of Pakistan. Mr. Huram is visiting Slovenia for the first, first time. The lecture will be given in English. It will uh, be followed by a discussion with Mr. Huram, moderated by my colleague, Bakhtar Aljaf, and myself, Ziad Bechirovic. And now I give the floor uh, to Mr. Abdullah uh, Huram. Hello, Mr. Ziad. Dobrodan. It's a great pleasure to be in your country. And it's been less than 24 hours I'm here and I'm already feeling home. And if you compare, there are a lot of similarities between Balkans and the Middle East. But in the last 24 hours, what I've realized is the most important similarity is the level of hospitality. So thank you very much for the warm welcome. And I understand that speaking here with a Pakistani accent in Slovenia uh, and speaking in English might not be the best combination. So if I'm going fast, please, you can wave me or let me know, and I'll uh, slow down. As an outsider uh, looking at South Asia and Middle East, uh, I might not, uh, I, I'm here at a lot of disadvantage because I might not know enough about the Balkans. But that is also the precise advantage, because sometimes, as an outsider, you have less constraints and local mindsets. And you might be able to think out of the box sometimes, bringing in perspective from the rest of the globe rather than from the region itself. 
so what I've done today is I have listed down eight themes and I will first three will discuss the domestic politics in Balkans. The next four will discuss the international dimensions and the last one will sort of sum it up. If you see the data networks, one of the most important things was uh, they achieved was in Bosnia, they granted each party, each ethnicity, the power to elect your own president or their own government. So, and that was vital if the accords were to be achieved. But the same thing which led to the success cause is today causing a lot of problem. Because if you see in Bosnia, there are a lot of intermarriages between different ethnicities. But despite that, at the political level, the clause in Dayton Accords re-emphasizes the ethnicities at, at the government. So what happened as a result is you have you're emphasizing a lot on ethnicity and not on Bosnian identity. So the first lesson is let's build multi-ethnic central institutions. Yes, we need local governments, but central institutions with representations from all ethnicities across the spectrum. And within this point, you see that we need to restore hope in the state. As I'm talking to a lot of Slovenes, I'm realizing that it's very similar to talking to people in Pakistan or the Middle East who have lost hope in their state, who have lost hope in the future. And that needs to be revived. We're always discussing problems and barriers rather than solutions. So that's the mind solution mindset is what we should be looking at. So this is, this is what I can call the crisis of exhaustion or the crisis of distrust or disillusionment from which we need to come out. And to come out of this, one of the things we can do is, instead of talking about the group rights, like ethnicity rights or Shia rights or Sunni rights or Slovene rights or Kuwait rights, we should rather be talking about individual rights in which every individual in a country, irrespective of his ethnicity or sect, is given equal rights. Point number two here is economics is the key. And uh, let me bring a quote here. If you want to solve any problem in the world, either convert it into a security problem or a business problem, and it will be solved. If we keep saying these are humanitarian issues, they will remain important, but they might not attract the best kind of global attention. Uh, so in this economics point, I believe China and Turkey can both be the key to solving Balkan issues. And they can be the key to bringing stability and economic investment into the region. If we see the Chinese role, uh, it, the Balkan-Chinese connection can actually be a win-win for both. It brings economic investment into Balkans. And in terms of China, they're at the backyard of EU without having to play by EU rules. So they can come into the region have all the economic activity, have free trade with EU, but without passing through any regulation. In terms of Turkey, uh, we see that Turkey has a very historical Ottoman times connection with the Balkan countries. And Turkish Airlines today is the, perhaps the only airline in the world which travels to, which flies to every capital of the region. And if you see the current prime minister, who was then the foreign minister uh, of Turkey, Ahmet Davutoglu, he has been visiting Bosnia so much that he, any of his uh, long absences were a surprise rather than his frequent visits being a surprise. So Turkey has shown a great interest in the region. And reviving that and leveraging that for stability can be the key to economics. An idea here is I recently attended the Chicago Forum on Global Cities, and they developed this idea of sister cities. And if nation states are unable to solve all the problems, why don't we start intercity cooperation? So for example, if there is a conflict between two countries in the region, what we do is we have we make their capitals a sister cities and start making them cooperate on different issues, for example, dealing with organized crime, dealing with economic problems, dealing with poverty, rather than having to discuss only political problems at the national level. Uh, 
theme number three for today, uh, I sh shortlisted was leveraging modern, uh, leveraging moderate Islamic clerics to condemn terrorism. If we see Pakistan or many parts of the Middle East, it is difficult for public to know, and the public is in this fuzzy boundaries of what it means to be a good Muslim. And uh, some some are anti-American; they don't necessarily promote extremism, but they're anti-American. But they fall; in, they tend to fall into that camp. Now, other people might actually be violent, and then there might be third category, which might be thinking that this is really the Islam as as they see it. So, in this case, the problem should not be solved after the genie comes out of the bottle, as we see from nearly every country in the region. Such problems should be solved with precautionary measures. And for that, it is very important to leverage Islamic scholars and moderate Islamic forces in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Albania, and other countries in the region to condemn extremism and to give an alternative identity and to let the public know what it means to be a moderate Muslim. And for that, you don't need to go far to find best practices from anywhere else in the world. Rather, the best practices are available in your own history. Albania is one of the only countries in the world which had more Jewish population after World War II than before it. Because the Albanian Muslims were very hospitable to the Jews. So the idea here is, instead of making it an area of ethnicities, rather let's make Balkans an area of interfaith and inter-ethnicity uh, harmony. Theme for four for today is creating lobby in the US to fasten your process into the EU membership. Uh, if we see the signals coming from the EU, they might give a feeling in the Balkans that for the next five years or until the next until the end of this decade, there might not be more members coming into the EU, and which creates problems for reforms in Balkan countries, because it gives the governments less incentives and publics a distrust in the EU and in their own governments. And to promote this cause of the EU membership, it is very important that the lobby is not only done in the EU, but also in the US. Now, I've lived in Washington for a while, and I see there is a, there are think tanks on the Middle East, there are think tanks working on Europe, uh, Western Europe, but you really have no institute on Institute for Balkan Studies. And that is a force you need, that is a voice you need in important capitals of the world, including Washington. <clears throat> and such a force doesn't require money from each individual country. That can be a regional organization. I can give you an example of a group called the Turkic American Alliance, which, so the Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and others, instead of spending money on individual lobbies, this, this is a group called Turkic American Alliance, which lobbies for all of them at the same time. So such can be the group of Balkans. Now, a, next, a question coming from your end could be, how do you bring them all to the same page? In, considering the local fights and intra-country tensions between Balkan countries? Well, the answer is, we don't need to be on the same page. We just need to discuss those issues which promote the common cause. For example, joining the EU. For example, improving stability, improving the living standards, improving economics. We don't need to solve all political issues sitting in Washington. But such common causes can be promoted through such institutions. Uh, the day the tragedy took place in Libya, in which the American ambassador Chris Stevens died, uh, that day I was reading a poll in which it says only 35% of Americans would point out Libya on the map. So here I'm in Balkan countries, and people are asking how important are Balkans for America? Well, for the public, if they cannot place Libya on the map, where they're actively engaged, then how can Balkan countries expect the public to know everything happening in Balkans? 
So I think the voice needs to come from Balkan countries. The efforts need to start from here. And ultimately, it will spread throughout different publics and different government circles throughout the world. Uh, lesson five for uh, which I shortlisted was regain foreign policy autonomy. I, I've seen a tendency, for example, in the Pakistani public, uh, it's, for example, people see things very black and white, either you are US or I, either you are for China. And I'm seeing a similar tendency here that if you have to be pro-Russian, you are sort of anti-American. If you are pro-America and pro-EU, then you are anti-Russian. But uh, this is not a Cold War going on, and this is uh, not. These are certainly not times in which you choose one camp or the other. Rather, I think the idea should be to engage every possible super and regional power, including Turkey, including Russia, including China, including U.S., and anybody contributing to stability and investment in Balkans should be considered positive, irrespective of the political interests, which can be managed despite these investments. So you can have agreements, you can have different levels of agreements and different levels of disagreements with all these regional and superpowers at the same time. You don't necessarily need to choose. Uh, point number six for today is explaining the world that the local problems are in fact international problems. Many local problems, not all. Uh, for example, uh, many uh, articles would point out that there is heroin coming out of Afghanistan and then transported to Western Europe via the Balkan route. And if you see that, uh, many blame either Afghanistan or they would blame the routes through Albania, through Macedonia. But the narrative should be that these are international problems. And for them, you need an international solution. And you need global forums discussing this, rather than different countries putting blames on the countries through which the heroin passes. And similarly, like drug trafficking, migration and the refugee crisis is also a global crisis. As a result of Syrian war, the Balkans are at the forefront of, one of the forefronts of the refugee crisis. And I was just reading this morning that because there is a lot of policing at the police station, at the train stations, so as a result, many migrants are taking bicycles to travel to Western Europe. So how do you resolve these issues? I mean, the Balkan countries are themselves stuck in economic problems, and one cannot expect them to solve every problem. So we need international attention. Uh, similar was the case in Pakistan, which was the world which hosted the world's highest number of refugees until the last year when Turkey took over because of the Syrian refugees. The Pakistan hosted 1.5 million refugees, and it did not lead its cause worldwide. Yes, Pakistan should have been most humanitarian and hospitable towards the Afghan refugees, but at the same time, it should have become an international cause rather than a national cause. A very important point, theme number seven, rebranding the Balkans. If, if I Google Balkanization today, what I get is ethnic cleansing. What I get is divisions, chaos. But my idea for Balkans would be that in two decades time, when I type Balkanization on Google, it should mean overcoming differences. It should mean thinking beyond our divisions, cherishing diversity, and thinking beyond the divisions to work towards common prosperity, rather than balkanization meaning ethnic cleansing. And for this to happen, uh, it is important to restore not only your external image, but also the internal hope. I mean, in America, you have this American dream. In different parts of the world, people have different motives. But here in many parts of the Middle East, in Balkans, people are stuck in this permanent vicious circle of lack of hope, lack of trust in their governments, and that needs to be restored. And that can only be restored when you start spreading success stories, when you create best practices from within. And best practices are not only domestic, 
they're also international, which is precisely my theme number eight. We don't need to fix all the problems. Rather, we need to create ways around them to solve problems which are common. For example, uh, the best practices from within Balkans, we had this Slovenia and Croatia agreeing that the border crisis would be resolved by international tribunal. The second example is under the former EU foreign policy chief, Catherine Ashton, we had talks going on between Kosovo and Serbia, which was impossible some years back. Then we have this example of Albania, which have overlooked its past with Greece and allowed Greek investment to come into the region. <coughs> Similarly, another example is Macedonia has become the first country in Balkans which has demarked all its borders. So these are best practices from within, internationally and as well as domestically, which need to be promoted. And I see a very optimistic future for Balkans. I don't think we have a reason. Yes, there might be many reasons to be pessimistic, but one needs to look beyond them. And all the regions, including Balkans, Middle East, I think they have hope, and the publics and the government to strategize further to, for the common cause of prosperity and development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rama. I would, would like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Alaf to start with the uh, discussion. <coughs> The first question be, which I have for you is about the uh, the views of the administration of the United States about the Balkans. How they are looking about this? We talked this morning about this very shortly, but you can also to talk about this point because yes. I think it's a point of interest here for the for Slovenians and for the nations in the Balkans. So the U.S. is certainly interested in Balkans, like in many other parts of the world. But what I must differentiate is there is a difference between core interests of the US foreign policy and their peripheral interests. So Balkans, I think, lie on their peripheral interests. They are interests of stability and humanitarian interest. But I think they're certainly not the top five or top 10 foreign policy priorities of any government, whether it's a public or democratic or Do you change now or? Yeah, no, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, but the second part of the question, what do you expect that? Uh, because we know that the Republicans may, maybe the next president will be from the Republican party. And I think that Hillary Clinton also, she has the same view toward the Balkans. Because when we are talking about the Balkans, it's Russia here. Right. Now, your view about this. So I think uh, with Russia coming back to the geopolitical limelight of the world, Balkans will again become important. But the point here is not that Balkans will become important and the US might be back and Balkans will attract other parts of the world. But the important point is for Balkans to leverage this opportunity to give all these powers and incentive look beyond security. When you only have security interests, you have transaction relationships or relationships which go up and down. But when the interests are people to people, commercial, business, then there remains a basic level of stability in the relationship. For example, let's see the US-China relationship. A lot of political problems, but the economics keeps on happening. The people to people linkages keep on happening. And same opportunities need to be leveraged by countries like Balkans, Pakistan, Middle East, where only strategic issues are brought to limelight rather than economic issues and people to people issues. Uh, my another question is regarding investment from the United States. And you are also from Washington, you deal with the issue with the Middle East and with the Gulf states. How we can, as I know that the Gulf states and the investor from the Gulf states, when they are investing in one country, the first of all, they are looking, this is aligned with the United States, not a part, part of European Union. For example, South Korea, they invested there. Why? Because they are they have good relations with the United States. Which is the way you can to, talk, to tell us about your experience here to strengthen the economic relation between the United States and Slovenia? So as a, if I understand your question correctly, it's uh, how do you promote investment, yes. the bilateral investment between US and Slovenia? 
or US and Balkans. So uh, I think the US, com uh, like any other companies in the world, US companies are out for profit. And when they see inst incentives, they will be coming here. Uh, I don't think they will be looking into whether uh, Russia is here or whether their own government is here as much or not. They will be looking out for their interests. And it is the job of Balkan countries to market their investment opportunities so well and the rising tourism opportunities so well that they, those companies can invest. So I think it's a dual process in which, yes, the US government will need to organize forums and these joint business conferences, but at the same time, even more efforts are required from the Balkan countries themselves. My last question is uh, security of Southeastern Europe. We know the situation with Russia, with Ukraine, with Moldova. We know the situation with the Islamic State. This is the situation in Syria and Iraq. Now, your opinion, how they see all this challenge from the United States regarding the security of Southeastern Europe or Western Balkans? Or we are talking about the Balkans now. So as I emphasized before, uh, I think it's in primary U.S. interest to have stability in Balkans uh, for two reasons. One, for internal stability of the Balkans. Second, for uh, to stop the flow of extremism. Uh, we recently, there is a video of uh, the Islamic State in which they appeal to, uh, in their language, they, what they said was al Kosovans, uh, uh, al-Bosnians, uh, al-Albanians to be coming to joining them in war in Iraq. So uh, this is the primary U.S. interest to stop their infiltration into the Balkans. And the third interest is the revival of, sort of a revival of Cold War with the in Russia in which the Russian influence is curtailed down and the primary presence is that of the U.S. Thank you. Now, your question. Slovenia, but I'm not asking as an ambassador, I think many times here. My question is very simple as a citizen. You offer to us if you have the idea to bring more stability to the Balkans. You mentioned we need more China, more Turkey, something like that. Sure. Can you repeat why? For example, that's okay for both. A month ago or more than a month ago, the president of Turkey made an official visit in Albania. One of the things that you mentioned there is, was, please close those schools, education close, stop this education system that was provided, I don't remember who then, who is living in the United States of America. He's a former friend of Erdogan, but because now they do not have good relations, he said, stop it. But they do have a very functional, very thoughtful, very good education. I mean, schools in, not only in Albania, but even in other countries, even in the United States of America. And he said, no, because he's not happy with him, and he said also that he's a kind of terrorist. So, and then you stop it, and then I'll help you to reestablish everything. But this is a system that was not a system. A part of the education system where different schools were established since 20 years ago. And what well. Now this is one thing. The other thing is, what about China? Well, of course, China is working. There are other rules and regulations here. And these countries in the Balkans already have established economic relations and they have affected investments from different European or other countries. Can you do or say more about your idea? Yeah. Please. So I think uh, first there needs to be a recognition that there is no harm if other countries have interests in this region. If the Balkans or Middle East or South Asian countries would be superpowers, they might have similar interests too worldwide. So uh, having interest is not a problem. And now uh, the idea is that these countries navigate their interests and so maybe align them or leverage these opportunities to fulfill their interests by also serving or by if other countries' interests are fulfilled in our regions. So. Let's look at the Chinese investment. The Chinese, are, there's a railway diplomacy in Balkans. They're building a railway from Belgrade, Serbia to Bar, Montenegro, and doing a lot of other things. And uh, also building three ports in Croatia and Greece and uh, Albania. So 
this is contributing to development. Now, there might be eyebrows raising up that they're increasing their political influence and that might not align well with EU or some other countries. So economic investment does not necessarily translate into political influence. You can have economics for stability. Yes, it will increase political influence, but at the same time, you can curtail it down. For example, in Montenegro, there are two groups, one which wants to have NATO and the other, the Serbs, they want to be in the Russian camp. So let's, let's suppose the government of Montenegro wants to join the EU and NATO. So at political level, they can keep supporting EU, but the Russian investment coming in for economics, why refuse that? It's money coming into your country and it's for creating employment. Why not? And similar would be my answer for Turkey. Uh, if they're asking to close schools, uh, first of all, I was not aware of this. And uh, that doesn't even mean the countries start fulfilling every wish that other countries, including many regional powers or international powers have. But at the same time, you can't just stop them from coming. Their resources can be leveraged for local development. Another question? You have? Please, please. You have already mentioned the China's interest and the potential of China's investment in the region. But of course, uh, you have mentioned your Pakistan rules. Right. So where is India with their investment? They are very much uh, oriented towards itself. They are still investing at home. But when can we expect uh, more investments from India in this region? Why do we can not just go? I think the Indians uh, are investing worldwide, and I do not have specific data on Indian investments in Balkans, but I'm sure they're active like many different parts of the world, and I don't know when it will be uh, further increased. I really don't have data for <laughs> Indian investments. Uh, just to turn the focus a little bit to I share very much all the issues which you have expressed here. It appears it's true, it's good that we are. But there is an interest in Balkans, of course. The worst thing to be is there will be no interest. Right. Like economic, like political, and so on. It is, of course, the problem how we, in facing the foreign interests, shape our national interests and promote them. Yes. The, that is it, actually. Exactly. The, Art of the politics. But as I said, let me focus on another topic which you are surely aware of. You know, in the Islamic court, there are profound processes taking place. Islam and Muslim world is uh, something which is in the center, I would say, of the contemporary interest in international relations. It is close to two. One billion and a half population <coughs> rises here and there. Right. Enormous riches, enormous potential, people, natural resources, and so on. And Islamic world is in the process of change. And somehow one can ask him the question what will be the Islamic world after him? Will these radical tendencies, which you see here and there, not only the Islamic state, Muslim brothers, all kinds of radical movements everywhere, even in the Balkans. Even in Bosnia, we have some radical groups, even in Bosnia. And on the other side, a tendency of the modern world, which is also touching the Muslim world. To me, it was always a surprise why the Islamic intelligentsia is somehow the, the part of the Islamic intelligentsia which looks toward modernity. If you'd like to have Muslim world, modern world, in the practical, is very so thin, not speaking loud. It's much more heard from the conservative radical views than from the modern views, which are somehow there, of course, but which are not spoken out loud. So within Islamic countries, yes, there are a lot of problems going on, but there are uh, 
some countries which have gone beyond these problems. Uh, you have Turkey, you have Malaysia, which the population remain Islamic, and a significant percentage would also follow the prayers and fasts and all the traditions. But uh, at the same time, they're modern, they're democratic, and uh, they're doing everything else which the other countries around the world are doing. So I think there is no problem of Islam and modernity coexisting. The real problem is the fuzzy boundaries between a lot of issues. For example, extremism, strategic policies of the Islamic the Muslim countries, and then you have colonialism and a lot of other things. So one phenomena which takes place in a lot of Muslim countries is when you have electoral democracy, sometimes the democratic values tend to go down. For example, in Egypt, the Coptic Christians felt much safe under an authoritarian government of Mubarak than they felt under the Muslim Brotherhood government, which was, by the way, elective, and Mubarak government was an authoritarian one. So uh, I think these uh, overlap of a lot of these complicating factors is what creates the real trouble here. And uh, But otherwise, in theory and in practice in Turkey, Malaysia, and other Muslim countries, this Islam and modernity certainly coexists. I mean, we also have an example of Kazakhstan, which is multi-ethnic. It has grown so much recently, and yet it remains constitutionally secular, but the population remains Muslim. Are there any questions? Maybe my last question is here is, we talk also about this, about oil and American interest with oil. You have a proverb in the Middle East and in the world that where is oil, you will find the United States. Now you see that in the last 10 years, we are actually in the last two years, we are talking about a lot of these streams and pipelines, South Stream, Turkish Stream, I didn't know, Nabucco, do you think that Americans, they are interested to these streams, one of them is to go through Balkans, especially is Greece is inviting uh, Russia to participate and to finance this. So I, I think uh, the geopolitics of gas pipeline is certainly a very interesting one. And uh, to answer this question, I will first take you to South Asia, uh, Middle East, where, for example, Pakistan was uh, sort of in a dilemma between two pipelines. One was the TAPI, uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, India. The second was IPI, Iran, Pakistan, India. And the Russians were supporting the IP pipeline because they didn't want the Americans in this region or the American and French countries in this region to get access to the central Asian gas from Turkmenistan. And the Americans were interested in the TAPI, first of all, to access the central Asian energy route, and secondly, to avoid any integration of Iran in other economies, including that of Pakistan and India. So similarly, even in Balkans, we have this uh, gas pipelines. It's not only an economic issue. It's not only an issue of energy security. It's an issue of global geopolitics as well. Uh, and we saw the South Stream supported by the Russians. That had to be finished. And then the state of Nabucco and Turkish Stream, it's nowhere. We don't know what the status of that is. So I think, yes, it would be in American interests to have a Balkan region which is secure and which has its energy resources secure. But at the same time, uh, I don't know of the American willingness to finance it or even if there is enough money to finance these projects here. But I think if something will contribute to stability, they would certainly be promoting it. If not financially, then at least the idea of it. Uh, another question I have about uh, the strategy of the United States towards the Balkans. For there, Albania is the country number one. It's not right. That as ally, as a country which is, they come to believe them. After Albania, we have another country, but Albania is different. Is I am right here or not? Because you are, you will continue your journey from tomorrow, you will go to Zagreb, Podgorica, Tirana, and Pristina. Now, your view about the Albanians and Albani Albanian policy and Albanian lobby we are talking, 
in the United States. Uh, this morning I was searching about Balkan, I was Googling about the Balkan diaspora groups in the US, and the first group which comes was actually the Albanian. Uh, so yes, I think the Albanians uh, might be relatively stronger in Balkan region than uh, in US than other Balkan countries. But I'm not really sure if this is the only US priority in the region. I mean, the US supported the independence of Kosovo uh, in 2008. Then you pre the Dayton Accords in 1995. So the interest was all around the countries. But I don't know if Albania really is the only interest in the region. Thank you very much. Now, please, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and discussion as much as I did. I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Huram for his contribution to better understanding of Middle East, South Asia, and uh, Balkan. At the uh, end, I would like to invite you all uh, to the next event uh, at, uh, on uh, 7 July at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, our guest will be General Blagoj Grahovac from Montenegro, member of the Femis Advisory Board, with uh, his uh, presentation, uh, uh, with presentation, his new book entitled uh, Voice, Voices from the Deaf Room, Glasovi is Gluche Sobe. Thank you very much. Thank you. I give the for okay. my publication. Okay. 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 Very kind of you. Thank you. Maybe if you just stand.